Hello, Arjun. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. I'm doing okay. Uh, very busy, um, but busy is okay. Busy is fine. Busy yeah. means I've got a pulse, uh, and uh, it also means that, uh, I'm in work, and I'm grateful for that. Fantastic. And so, uh, it's great to be back at the church. It is. Wonderful job with Sunday service. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we've had a lot of positive comments about it, actually. Uh, and uh, it was a big challenge for me, sort of preaching live after 15 weeks. Um, uh, uh, and also, of course, for Rachel and Carol uh, and John involved as well, and yourself uh, in the background. I just felt it was important to uh, remind folk that um, we will be gravitating back to the church premises, even though we can't meet all together in the main church because of the exciting building work that's going on. Fantastic. Yeah, it's great. It's great to be just back in the building, to be honest. Yes. Uh, properly, almost. Yes. And again, it's similar, but different. Yes, we're, still, we're still doing stuff that's different. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. So the reason why we are gathering now midweek, uh, just us two, yeah. uh, we uh, we thought that there was stuff that we cut out of bits and pieces of our work, yeah. uh, sermons and other talks and stuff, and, yeah. and not everything can always be pushed in together for, no. for a 15 or 20 minute or yeah. half an hour sermon. Yeah. And so we thought, why not have a, another time during the week yeah. where we can uh, talk a, a bit extra or ex expand on, on some of the stuff that we've already done. It's like it's like all the extras on the DVD. Yeah, we're, these are these are the deleted scenes, essentially. Absolutely. <laughs> but they're but they're very yeah. much intended rather than absolutely uh, cut out. Yes. Uh, and so we are looking back again at the, the mm. first chapter of Ephesians. Yeah. Uh, you spoke rather well with it on uh, on Sunday morning, which I, I've already said. Thank you. But, uh, but feel free to say it again. Yeah. <laughs> very good. But what we uh what we want to start off with, we're going to go through a few of the verses yeah. and just try and unpack a few of them with yeah, sure. some of the things that. We might revisit some of the things you said. Yeah. We might just expand on a few others. Sure. No, that's absolutely fine. That's and so the first thing that uh, I thought we'd dive into, and it's one of my favourite things to talk about, mm. not really, but let's open up this can of worms anyway. So the, El the Calvinist and the Arminian debate, yeah. where we, uh, in verses four and five, uh, it uses terms such as chose us yes. uh, before every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. He yeah. chose us in him before the foundations of the world. And then in the start of verse five, it says he actually predestines us yeah. For the adoption into himself. Yeah. I mean, this is um, an important discussion and debate, which quite a lot of people aren't in the slightest bit interested in, and, and that's fine. Uh, but for a number of people, they are interested and, and, and actually find it quite challenging, uh, almost kind of, kind of disturbing, really. Uh, and so um, what you've got is a, a debate running on both sides between those who believe that uh, God has predestined everything, so we have no free will, uh, and those, if you like, who believe the exact opposite, that, that we have free will and that God hasn't predestined uh, anything. And the challenging thing in Scripture, and not least in Ephesians chapter 1, is that they both seem to come together. It's when these two things come together that confusion can uh, really uh, arise. I think that there is one way of uh, unlocking this quite simply, and that is that with Ephesians in particular, is remembering that Paul is sending a round robin letter. This isn't just a one letter. It's to the, so this isn't just one, a letter to one church. It's a letter to all of the churches uh, in Ephesus and possibly Asia Minor. He is writing to Jews and Gentiles. Uh, and he is writing, um, amongst other things, to encourage them to integrate together into the one community. There's more about that, actually, in the second half uh, of chapter two. But I think what you have here in the beginning of uh, Ephesians is that Paul saying, speaking primarily to Jews at the beginning, to the Jewish people, and this is quite a controversial viewpoint, by the way, but that he's speaking to the Jewish people, he's speaking to Israel, that you were chosen before the foundation of the world. I think he's referring specifically to Israel and to the Jewish people. And then later on uh, in the chapter, and I think it's in verse 13, uh, where he speaks, in him you also... Uh, and I think the also there is referring to the Gentiles. What I'm saying is, is that God does not choose some to exclude others. God chooses some to reach others. Predestination, uh, calling, adoption, it's functional. And although this seems a little bit wacky, um, quite frankly, it sits very comfortably with the narrative of the Old Testament where God chose Israel, chose that nation, to reach the pagan nations. Uh, and so what we have here is God choosing a, a nation uh, within which people have always had the opportunity to um, rebel against, 
uh, and not be part of God's family. But he has chosen a people to reach others. Uh, and for me, this, um, this really does help reconcile um, the debate about whether everything is predestined or not. And I do accept this is, a, this is a discussion and debate which interests a lot of people, not one bit, but which for other people is a really important matter and can actually cause distress. I mean, has God chosen me or not can be quite a distressing thought. Well, God chose a nation to reach you with the gospel. So we have, we have this opportunity uh, to respond. So I think this is what is going on in the first chapter of mm. Ephesians. I think it's tracking, frankly, God's plan and purpose for Israel in the Old Testament, which it did not fulfill, and because it can only be fulfilled uh, through Jesus. So um, we do have free will uh, to respond to God because this light has been brought to us uh, initially uh, through the nation uh, Israel, but supremely through Jesus himself. Mm. So that's what I'm saying with my predestined free will. Nice. But then the sec so the second part of the verse five mm. goes into adoption. Yes. And uh, being taken in into God's family almost. Or I think this is an absolutely amazing thought. And I don't think as Baptists, oddly enough, we have a full enough understanding of what it means to be adopted into the family of God. I think there are other denominations that have a much better and fuller understanding uh, of the fact that, that God has adopted us through Jesus into his family. Um, Rachel and I, we have um, fostered children in the past, and we know people, partly through that training, who have gone further, and it is further, and they have uh, adopted children. Um, I really do believe that adoption is the highest expression of love that there is. Uh, and I know that some people who have been adopted have sometimes struggled with the fact that they have been adopted. And I, when I meet with them, I said, no, no, the highest expression of love there is has been bestowed upon you. That's actually what adoption is about. Uh, and so there is no higher love that God could, can bring to us than adoption. Uh, and I do think as, as Baptists, for what, for what this is worth, I, I think we need to reflect more than we do upon the fact that the love that God has for us is the love of adoption. Having said that, there is a pragmatic dimension to it as well. And that is that the Apostle Paul, in speaking of adoption, uh, he's referencing Roman law. He doesn't always reference Jewish law. Mm. Um, the armour at the end of Ephesians 6 is Roman armour, it's not Jewish. So Paul is quite happy to take illustrations from Rome and Greece, as well as Israel and the Jewish people. Uh, and if you uh, adopted somebody as a Roman citizen, and they were very often an adult, uh, the Ben-Hur storyline is historically accurate, mm -hmm. and you would adopt a child, you'd adopt an adult as your son or daughter, to perpetuate your name. There was that pragmatic element to it. And so uh, there is therefore this pragmatic dimension to uh, God adopting us, that it gives us this uh, joy, but also it gives us this responsibility to perpetuate not our name and our reputation, but God's name and his reputation, God's reputation and his family name. So being adopted is an absolutely amazing truth, but there is also an element of responsibility about it as well. And you know me, I would talk about responsibility as well as fun, wouldn't I? Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> and like through adoption, like we, we, we into, into, especially into Christ's kingdom, we get, our, we get purpose, we, yes. get, we get meaning, we get value. Mm. Um, you know, adoption into a family, yes. you're, 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 you're hopefully given a bed and, and yes in the right circumstances you know it's always going to be a, a hopefully a better situation than from yeah. where you were there's a there's a little a chorus that goes and you'd be grateful to know that oh, well, i'm not going to sing this oh, yes <laughs> part of his family living in victory and sure in knowing that jesus has got everything in hand mm. i did that as a rap then did you think i was quite good oh, spoken word 100 percent. yeah there we are there we, there are. we go my, my, uh, my expertise in rap has no beginnings 
<laughs> there we go. And, and hopefully it doesn't need to have an end. <laughs> um, so let's continue on. We'll push through. Yeah, sure. uh, and so we, we're talking about it's, uh, it's only through Jesus that we're able to be adopted. Yes. And, and, and through the redemption through, through blood. Yes. I mean, this is a, perhaps quite a difficult concept, but it's an important one. Um, it, it tracks back um, as predestination and calling does to the Old Testament where um, at the, um, that there will be this annual day of atonement, uh, at which point animals would be slain, uh, blood would be spilled. And this happened uh, through other festivals and rites uh, as well. Uh, but that um, in Old Testament times, your sins were forgiven um, through the blood of a sacrificial animal. Now it was past sin. Mm. And if you like present, it was not future. And that's actually quite important because um, supremely when Jesus died upon the cross and shed his blood for us so that we could be redeemed, it wasn't only our past and present sin that was dealt with, it's our future as well. Right. And this is why scripture says that he was the full and final sacrifice. So as hard as it is to grasp and to understand, uh, when Jesus died upon the cross and shed his blood for us, we were able to have this access to God our Father, and it is only through that blood. Um, there's an older generation of preachers saying that a younger generation of preachers are preaching an anemic gospel, and I agree with them, because I'm older rather than younger. I think a lot of the gospel which is being preached today is bloodless, and we need to get back to understanding that it is only through Jesus' shed blood upon the cross that we have redemption for our sins. Now, I absolutely get it that these words and concepts need to be unpacked. There isn't really time to do it today, but they need to be unpacked. What they must not be is ignored. Yeah. And Paul refuses to ignore some of the difficult concepts, actually, in, in Ephesians. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, yeah I remember... Start early, some of my early devotionals, which is quickly because we haven't got much time. But um, I was writing it, my friend, I was talking to one of my mentors, one of my friends at the time, and he said, But why? Why is this important? Mm. And, and I'd gotten so carried away with trying to explain mm. one little bit of a concept yeah. that I completely mm. forgotten to mention. Yeah. That was only because of the Jesus, yes. you know, that the, all this had happened in the yeah. end. Yeah. And to circle it around and bring it back to that yes. rather than to, to push out another point. Yes. yes. And I've only got 400 words. Yeah. Use it wisely, <laughs> yes, rather than try and stretch it too thin. Yes, uh, I mean it's not accidental, isn't it? Is it that you know this cloth here is red, uh, and it signifies the blood of Jesus uh, upon the cross. I didn't choose this shirt for that though. I'm, <laughs> I mean, that, yeah. that's just a mistake. <laughs> no, maybe not. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so from that adoption, especially, yes, we have our in inheritance. Yes. Yes, I think that um, inheritance is probably something else that we're not. Um, it's a scene that we're not mining as well as we could be. Um, we have our identity in Jesus. We have been adopted uh, into the family of God to perpetuate his name. And what this means, therefore, because we are children, is that we have an inheritance. Now, I think that here the parable of the prodigal son becomes pretty relevant because the younger son, as I think most people know the story, takes his inheritance early, takes his inheritance ahead of time, when he asked his father, can I have my inheritance now? He was saying to his father, I wish you were dead. Mm. That's actually what he was saying. He takes his inheritance and he just squanders it uh, on riotous living. There is something about inheritance here that we need not to squander. We need to take really seriously. What does it mean to live as a son of God now and to have this future inheritance? Well, one of the things it means is that we live in the now and the not yet of the kingdom of God. The, the kingdom of God has arrived. John's gospel is the clearest of the four gospels on this one. The kingdom of God has arrived, but there is a future aspect to it as well. Uh, and we live therefore uh, between the two. So um, we do have an inheritance as Christians. I don't think that we are always good at exploring that and, and working out the implications of it. And sometimes we want everything now as Christians when God has planned something for us for the future. Well, surely inheritance indicates future 
as well as present. Mm. Uh, and I think too, too many times as Christians, we want everything now, now, now. Um, when God is saying, be patient, wait. There is a future dimension to um, your identity uh, and your inheritance by definition includes a future aspect. Um, this is hard to describe, it's hard to unpack, um, but it is uh, really important. And what Paul then goes on to say towards the end of this chapter, and I don't think I brought this out very well at all actually last Sunday, is that um, we have been given the Holy Spirit as, if you like, a down payment, mm. a seal, uh, a guarantee of what is to come. Uh, uh, and so this may be a way of understanding our inheritance as well. That when we become Christians, the Holy Spirit comes into our life, comes into our heart. We should be praying to be baptised in the Holy Spirit every day, ideally every hour. But this seal of the Holy Spirit has this future dimension to it uh, as well. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to... I think, describe and teach properly what it means, what our inheritance in Christ means, uh, but it sure is important. Yeah, and it's sealed with the promise yeah. of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so we, 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 it's a, a promise, yeah. the promises aren't broken, especially no. by God. Indeed. Unless they're exceeded. <laughs> well, indeed. Yeah, but, indeed, indeed. But, so we're promised, we're promised this through, yes. through the blood of Christ, yes. and it's sealed with the Holy Spirit, yeah. as again, another promise. Yes. It's interesting you mention that, though, because the writer in Hebrews does say that you know, the people did not receive what they had promised because God had got something greater for them. Mm. And that is an interesting uh, dimension about God's promise, that sometimes God will give us more than he had promised us. Yeah. Uh, cool. We're, we're still running out of time, so we're going to keep mm -hmm. going. Uh, we've, we've, gone, we've gone, we've just hit up 13. We're going to go all the way up to now 17. Yep. Uh, and so it's, uh, you did speak about this in, on Sunday. But it's, it's a great one to explore and, and to keep pushing on because the yeah. prayer of revelation, that we continue to yeah. seek that wisdom yes. and knowledge. Yeah, I mean, this is what Paul is praying for, for the Jews and the Gentiles. Uh, and he's basically saying that I know that you know that you've been adopted into the family of God. Um, so that this is me saying this is just a reminder. However, what I want for you is that you will have more revelation from God than you already have. And I think this is a prayer that we should be praying for ourselves and indeed for others uh, every day. And it's a bit risky. It's quite challenging. Um, I think it is very easy to become content with our present revelation mm. of God. I think it's very easy to be okay with what we now know about God. And we sense something which would be true, that if we pressed further into that, and God revealed more of himself to us, and perhaps revealed more of ourselves to us, that, that might engender big changes in our lives and new challenges. And hey, that's scary, isn't it? Um, nevertheless, we must press forward. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so this prayer for greater revelation. I mean, I think, and I've met this countless times as a church minister and church leader, I don't think there's anything sadder than uh, a believer, a genuine believer in God, who has become content with their present revelation. And that's just where they want to stay. Mm. I, I cannot count the, the amount of people that come into this category, it's a lot. Um, it's sad for them, they actually become a drag on church growth. So it actually matters to other people as well. Uh, I think that um, we must constantly be coming back to God's word to take on board the one line that God has yet more light to shed from his word. And to say, God, you know, I need more of you. And that more doesn't mean more of the same. It's new revelation, not revelation that goes beyond scripture, that's forbidden. Mm. Uh, but more revelation of God that is contained within scripture, which up until this moment, we haven't seen, perhaps because we have chosen not to see it. Or as my mum would say, in her Yorkshire way, uh, there's none so blind as those who choose not to see. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember growing up as a kid, you know, mm. getting to church, and I remember like right around 16, 17, mm. sitting in church, is like, I think I know enough. You know, mm. Mm. <laughs> I'm happy. I don't. Mm. I, don't mm. I go to church every week, and I'm challenged by something different, and I don't like it. I was happy yeah. where I was last yeah. week. <laughs> I mean, but I mean, you grow stagnant in that, 
Um, yeah. And if you had a glass of stagnant water, you're not going to drink it. It's no use no. to anyone. You throw it away. Yes. You might water a plant with it, but yes, <laughs> yeah, no, you get no. rid of it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the point has often been made about um, the difference between the Red Sea and the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is stagnant. Uh, uh, the Red Sea is not, and, and parts according to God's will and purpose. Um, but uh, we do not need to be uh, stagnant. We need to be free flowing uh, and moving. Uh, and uh, I'm really kind of excited about that. Yeah. I mean, I, for several years now, the, the, the newer thinking on leadership has been, you know, kick out mission statements and bullet points and all of that nonsense. What leaders need to do is to embrace uncertainty. That's what leaders need to do. Uh, at the moment, of course, we've been forced into it. Yeah. Uh, I think Christians should embrace uncertainty knowing that this will bring us greater revelation of who God is and once again greater revelation of who we are and who we could be I mean that's the exciting thing about it um, and uh, think about you know the little um, little parable of, it's not in the bible of course but of a man who, who goes to heaven uh, he's in heaven he's been forgiven he's been saved he's in heaven uh, and Jesus is showing him around and there's this wonderful statue of this person uh, in heaven uh, and the man says well you know who is this uh, and Jesus said well this is who you could have been mm. yes yeah. we could have been and I think there are many Christians who are not fulfilling their potential and holding their church back because they are content with their present revelation of God and one writer calls describe these Christians as being eclipsed. Yeah. You sense I feel quite strongly about this. I, I, I do. It's good. But what is also strong mm. is the name above all names. Yes. Our last point for today, because we're yeah. running quite a bit over now. Well, <laughs> okay. No, no, that, that's fine. I, I will be brief. Um, Paul refers to Jesus, whose name is above all names. And it's a phrase which is actually familiar to us. We sing it. Mm. And we, uh, Jesus' name above all names. So that's me doing a rap again. Yeah, 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 don't sing it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and, but the origin of that phrase, or the backstory, is actually quite intriguing because um, amongst the pagan nations, uh, not so much, of course, amongst the Jewish people, but amongst the pagan nations, um, if you were going to enter into a contractual vow, um, if you were going to put your name to something of huge significance, you wouldn't invoke the name of your God to help you. You wouldn't do that you would invoke the name of the God who was higher than the God you worshipped. Just that all the bases are covered. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this is quite a common practice to invoke the name of the God that was above the name of your God. Now, this phrase, therefore, name above all names, is actually picking that up and saying that there is no name which is higher than the name of Jesus. There is no name that is higher than the name of God. Uh, and that's the backstory, if you like, to this phrase about name above all names. Uh, and I think it's kind of quite interesting. It may just be important that we know that, that the name of Jesus, the name of God, our father, the name of our family, uh, we can rest assured. Mm. We can have, have tremendous hope that there is no name that is higher than that. Yeah, I was it Old Testament, you know, King of Kings, absolutely, Lord of Lords, yeah, but... higher of highest, you know, yes, yes, there's nothing greater, yes, no, no, we, we have exchanged our name, uh, when we were adopted into the family to a name that is higher. We have gone from uh, being um, the grandchild of Palpatine to being part of the Skywalker family. Oof, oof, Star Wars reference, there we go. I, I just could not resist getting that in. I mean. I, I hope you are impressed. Yeah, I mean, I haven't even watched all of them, so. Well, there we are. There we are. <laughs> I think we just lost a few viewers. That's cool. <laughs> yes, that's Yeah, right. <laughs> cool. Perhaps right. I should have said spoiler alert. Spoiler alert, maybe. <laughs> but, uh, thank you so much, Adrian. Okay. I'm well. sure we'll be back next week if people like it. <laughs> well, I'm sure we'll be back if people don't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're going to keep going. We are. We, we are. If there's an audience out there, that's a possibility. Yeah, we, we've run a little bit over, but that's okay. Yes. I'm sure it was well intended. Well, I'm sure it's probably predestined, actually. Ooh, okay, <laughs> that's cool. All right, thank you very much. We'll uh, see you again next time. Yeah, okay. Good. Bye-bye. You can go now. <laughs>